welcome to IF Oxford. It's lovely to see so many of you joining us today. Thank you all for coming. Tonight's sponsor for this event is the Association for the Study of Animal Behaviour, and we're very grateful for the grant that they gave us to put this event together. But let's move on to tonight's event, Freedom of Movement. How do animals get around in our modern world? I'm gonna hand over to Emma and she will guide you through tonight's event. Welcome everyone. Tonight's event represents the collective work of a poet, three scientists, four conservationists, a comedian and a storyteller. Join us on a spoken word journey as together we explore why and how animals move around and how human activities can both help and hinder this movement. In the first half, we hope that the conversations, poems and stories that you hear will encourage you to take a new view of our landscapes through the eyes of some of the other animals that we share it with. In the second half, you're invited to join our storyteller in a town where the residents have a decision to make and would value your help. The evening is going to finish with a Q&A session where you're welcome to ask our team of scientists, conservationists and writers any questions you may have. We hope that you enjoy the event. Take a bird's eye view of our landscape. What do you see? Fields, woods, towns, and running through them, roads, railways, arteries for human movement. But we're not the only ones who live in this landscape and not the only ones who need to get around. The green woodpecker is a bird with a loud call that sounds like laughter. It has many nicknames, including rainbird, knickerpecker, and the best known one, yaffle. Although green woodpeckers often live in woodlands, their favorite food is ants, and the best place to find ants is in nearby gardens and meadows. Yaffles. This rainbird on the regular shuttle from his whittled woodland home it's Jack Eichel, the weathercock, green as a crab apple, with clown red crown and yellow bum. He and Betsy, the knickerpecker, bringing their young to the garden buffet, stippling the lawns to scoff as many ants as they can snaffle. And after the Formic family picnic, he and she and the little yaffles, their laughter making the meadows rattle, dip diving home on their daily run. There's no such thing as online deliveries if you're a green woodpecker. To find food means leaving your woodland home and going out to search for it. But at least the green woodpeckers have got wings. Getting around to find your dinner is not nearly so easy if you can't fly and you're only four inches tall. I'm going to hand you over now to our comedian, Alex Farrow, who's been chatting to Jack Cowley to find out more. Jack is a local conservationist and co-organiser of Kirtlington's Hedgehog Street project. Over to you, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. I host um, Jericho Comedy at the Natural History Museum. And Jack, it, it is lovely, lovely to see you. How are you? Hello, Alex. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm very well. Uh, this, this month I had a hedgehog on my doorstep around midnight. Wow. Now, I, I had missed last orders, that's why I was there. Why was there a hedgehog on my doorstep? Well, first of all, you're very lucky. What a, what a sight. Uh, the hedgehog was probably on your doorstep because he was trying to look for some food and ended up bumping across your steps. And uh, yeah, that's when you probably found him. Well, sh should I have let him in? Is that, is that a good thing to do? Would he have wanted to go in? I, I left him out in the cold, unfortunately. Unless you have a great stash of uh, beetles, maybe some caterpillars in your kitchen, <laughs> then you probably wouldn't have been that interested. I tend, uh, I tend not to um, have, a, have a stash of beetles in, in there, but he was looking for food. I hear that, I hear that hedgehog will, will hog the whole hedge. Uh, why, why does it love a hedge so much? I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, they're, they're just great environments for, for the food that the hedgehogs like to eat, as well as our gardens, right? Gardens and hedges, often similar, in ha similar habitats. And um, yeah, that's why, that's why they're there. Got it. So we were talking earlier, Jack, and you've been telling me when they're eating beetles, caterpillars, there's a, a surprising end result. Can you tell me about that? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's you'll, be, you'll be like, yeah, they, 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 they put them out, Alex. Yeah, Tell yeah, me more. Tell me more. <laughs> but, no, no. It, yeah, it's the, the natural process. It's, uh, it's more, <laughs> you want to end out the other. But yeah, when it comes out the other end, it's, um, it's, it's notable. And that's actually the way to identify um, hedgehogs is... Well, one of the ways, one of the few ways. You, you, you can't look at them. You, you must no, no, investigate no. their poo. No, <laughs> there's, no, no, no. No, there's no other way to know a hedgehog's been in your house. Such um, garden. Exactly. No, if uh, the, the, one of the, the trails they leave are, are these, these small, small droppings, which often have a very special characteristic, as you mentioned. Well, what, is, what is the special cat characteristic? They are uh, glistening, so to speak, or, or glittery in appearance. Uh, um, due to the, um, as the, as the insect casing, the exoskeleton or wing casings are broken down in the digestive system by the hedgehog, the, uh, end result of these kind of refractive, mm. reflective mm. bits of, uh, material that cause the, the, the poo to, to glisten. You, you can't polish a turd, but you can make it sparkle. Is, yeah. is that what you're telling me, Jack? Exactly. Yeah. That's straight, straight from the expert's mouth there. <laughs> um, I know, uh, I know people will often put out milk for a hedgehog if they want to attract a hedgehog. Will, oh, will, will milkshake bring all the hogs to the yard? <laughs> it may so, well do, but it also make, it make them very unwell afterwards as well. Um, I know. Like any great party. Uh, but yes, I know it's, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> you can actually have um, the best food for hedgehogs is probably cat food and dog food, both in wet a meaty like wet variety and then some dry biscuits as well or you can actually get designated hedgehog food but milk and bread are definitely a bad idea definitely and out will they will they stop the poo being sparkly exactly they will, they will be, just... be horrible yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the the hedgehog is looking for food yeah or she they're looking for food uh how, how far how far is a hedgehog going to travel no, I mean, they look like, I've got one behind me, they look like I've got tiny legs. How far, how far can one of these things go? Well, hedgehogs are in a bit of a race right now to store, um, build fat reserves, right, for the winter, where they hibernate in their hibernaculums that they build, oh. uh, which is around um, November, the, uh, November time. And uh, yeah, so they're, they're willing to travel quite a distance in one evening. The average distance traveled by hedgehog foraging is about one mile, maybe one to two miles as well. So quite quite a considerable distance. Um, and this is often in the urban habitat uh, is, it looks like basically perimeters, perimeters of gardens, edges of hedges, that sort of thing. So, that's, um, why they, that's why they hog the hedge, that's, that's exactly. their thing. They need, they need edges. Exactly. <laughs> um, what sort of problems does a hedgehog encounter getting at the good stuff? Getting at them beetles, getting into the garden. What are we talking about? Uh, walls, uh, fences, doorstops. Doorstops. Yes, indeed. Me getting home after the pub. Yeah. What? So, Jack, your your job, if I'm summarising it correctly, is helping is helping hedgehogs into places. What does what does that, what does that involve? Well, um, in my village, we have a a project called Curtington Hedgehog Street which is essentially creating a, a network or a highway of routes for hedgehogs to move between gardens so that they can um, forage as effectively as possible and forage un, uninterrupted and without being blocked. And so this comes across in the form of drilling or, build, or building or constructing holes with consent of the, the homeowner between yeah. gardens. So, so your job is going up to people's fences and drilling a hole in them. Does yeah. that are people? <laughs> does that creep people out? Or in the name of um, freedom of movement? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And uh, just before we leave, what is the what is the name of your of your current project? It's um, Curtington Hedgehog Street. And how can people get involved with drilling holes in their fences so that you and or hedgehogs can get in? So, so there's a, it's actually a national initiative, um, and these hedgehog streets are up and down the country. We just happen to have um, a very active one. We've, we've had multiple expansions past different parts of the village, but um, it can really happen anywhere. And it's, it's as simple as having a conversation with your neighbour. Uh, if, you, if you're aware there's maybe hedgehog activity in your garden or you've been feeding one, just speaking with your neighbour, having this conversation, get the communication going. Um, I mean, this and, is very difficult for British people. I, I know. Mean, having to know, speak to your neighbour sounds hard. We've got to dig deep here. You know? <laughs> We've really got to dig deep.
um, you know, but it was it's, it was a great opportunity. Uh, and it still is. It's growing, and it's great to see people um, getting involved. You know, great. Kurt Ligson, Hedgehog Street Project. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a great project. It gives me hope seeing people, um, you know, m make this effort and, and be inspired to take a step where you know putting nature first at the heart of our decisions. It's a really great thing to see, especially in the lead up to um, COP twenty six, things like that. Right, big time. Thank I you very it. much, Alex and Jack, for giving this a hedgehog's eye view of their movement challenges and particularly of how people are helping to take these challenges away. If we could follow our hedgehogs around, we would find a hidden network of hedgehog highways threading through our countryside and towns, each one representing a different hedgehog's favorite nightly route under fences along hedgerows and through the holes that people make for them. Many animals need to move around day to day to find food. But some animals make a special journey once a year in order to come together to breed. Frogs and toads spend most of their life on land eating bugs and slugs in our gardens and woodlands, but they need water in order to lay their eggs and raise their tadpoles in. This means every spring they must make a special journey back to the ponds where they were born in order to breed. No matter what challenges and pitfalls lie in the way, they know they must get there. They wait until dusk to cross. It's safest in the dark, or at least it used to be before rush hours were invented. Over the top. Tonight's the night we go over the top. All is ready. This is the hour. With the wood behind us, we crawl through the ditch and up the far bank. Before us lies no man's land, the grey waste. Great things rush past with noise, with explosions of light. It's a long, long way across. And the surface, even after rain, is rough, so hard on the feet. This is the way, this is the way it lies. The place we know in our blood is best of all. Companions fall behind and beside us. The route is littered with our dead. Through the great peril, we will come to it. Through danger and fear, we come at last to the place of safety. Coming home to softness of grasses, welcome of water. Meeting and mating in this most perfect of places. Here we are dancers, acrobats. We are graceful. Here we know and are known. Afterwards, there is the return crossing. It is what we do. Toads are not made. The it's National Toads on Roads project was set up to help migrating amphibians. Local conservationist Zara Linehan is going to tell us more. She is a member of the Bagley Wood Toad Patrol based just south of Oxford. Over to you, Zara. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> From the middle of February, when the chill in your bones has started to thaw, that's when you start looking at the weather forecast. You're looking for wet and warm, relatively. That's what they're looking for, too. It's worth taking a couple of trips out to see if there's any movement yet. And when there is, you're going to need all hands on deck. When I tell people I'm going out toading, they usually respond with confusion and bewilderment. Actually, that's probably not so much about what toading is, but more in relation to the fact that now we're talking about toads, when seconds earlier, they had no idea that that's where this conversation would be heading. Uh, we might have been talking about Netflix or our children's bedtime routine. It's something that I will crowbar into any conversation and never tire of talking about, despite even the least subtle indicators that my audience may not exactly share my enthusiasm for warty nocturnal amphibian life. 
everyone has their own reasons for joining a Toad Patrol. Maybe it's to get out of the house, away from the telly, away from their phone, or away from their family. They may have got a sniff as to what it's all about and decided to investigate further. Or perhaps they've been meaning to do more for wildlife beyond bird feeders and bug hotels and stumbled across this avenue of local conservation. Or maybe they were driving home one night, saw the carnage for themselves and wanted to do something to help. Whatever brings people out on patrol, the aim is simple. <coughs> help as many toads as possible to cross that road. The problem with toads is that they insist on returning to their ancestral breeding ponds to procreate. Even if you were to dig a lovely deep, they like deep water, brand new pond right next to them, many, especially old season, the old season brigade, would happily march past it in favour of the pond they grew up in, no matter how far or perilous the journey. So here is a photo of our toads. Um, it's along the path that leads from the road to the ancestral pond, so they're on the safe straight, should be easy from here, right? Here is a fallen tree. <laughs> and this little spot here is um, a pair of toads who've unfortunately had to scale this whacking great big fallen tree across their path. So it's pretty perilous. And uh, the photo here shows them a little more closely. Um, not only this whole returning to the ancestral breeding ponds thing, um, their chosen timing for this activity just after dusk, although entirely sensible from a nature-driven avoiding predation perspective, does not coincide very well with human activity. Because in mid to late February, after dusk coincides with evening rush hour. So it's a horrific meeting of mass movement of toad and vehicle. So what's the appeal of toad patrolling? Well, apart from the real life superhero feeling of rescuing a life or multiple from imminent danger, Apart from feeling you're making a difference in conserving a species with hands-on graft. Apart from the opportunity to see other nocturnal species pottering about their usual post-daylight activities, or to rescue other species also tempted into ill-advised road crossings by the damp, balmy weather, such as frogs. We've got a little frog, frog and toady couple that we'd rescued one evening. And newts. So here, I'd like to illustrate what it is that we're looking for. Um, it was a dark and wet night. The road is black and bumpy. Here, we have a black and bumpy newt, who is also very, very small in the dark, in the wet. So in case you can't see her very well, there's a slightly closer up picture of her. And this is what she looks like in her natural habitat. So this is a female great crested newt. Um, we come across quite a few every year making the same road crossing. And it is a delight and a privilege to find these ladies as well, this beautiful endangered species. But I digress. I describe to my friends, it's a bit like the ultimate treasure hunt. You get to leave all of your daytime responsibilities and demands at home. You put on your high vis, safety first, you grab your torch, and submit to one singular activity for a few hours. It's a form of mindfulness where your attention isn't split into several different directions and um, your head isn't filled with thoughts of the past, present and future, all jostling for position. It's just you and whatever's in your torch beam at that particular second when you find it. Whether it's a hopeful amorous male propped up proudly on bodybuilder forelimbs, or a turgid female <clears throat> swollen with hundreds of eggs, or a pair in amplexus, the male having hitched a ride on the female even before they hit the water in order to guarantee paternity rights. I like to call them double-deckers. That's the priceless reward for your time and energies coming out that night. The more time you spend with them, you appreciate that they are charismatic, they are driven, they are intelligent, and they are comic. They move more quickly than you'd expect often. Um, and inevitably, there will be casualties, despite your best efforts. 
Sometimes they'll hide in the undergrowth until you've passed with that nasty flashy light you're waving around, opting to make a dash for it behind your back. They can be easily missed, camouflaging against the tufty verge or among the leaves scattered and blown about the dark bumpy road. And sometimes people are just driving too fast at precisely the wrong time and place. Casualties are sad especially when it's a female the size of a grapefruit that's clearly survived that same journey out and back for decades. She successfully spawned thousands of offspring, has avoided predation, hibernation, drowning. Oh yes, those males can be over amorous. Sometimes multiple Casanovas will bundle a female to try and guarantee paternity rights and that can result in her drowning. All for it to be cut short by a single thoughtlessly placed car wheel but it does just drive home how important your efforts are. And when you see them safely in the pond, meeting away to each other, it makes it all worthwhile. This video is of our local pond. And all of these lovely little swimmers are the guys we've rescued. The road our toads migrate across has a 50 mile per hour speed limit. Here it is. So 50 miles per hour is clearly open to interpretation when it's later into the night and the roads seem clear and there's minimal chance the coppers will catch wind of it. It's a relatively busy important road that runs off this dual carriageway here. This filters traffic into market towns and villages skirting Oxford. On one side you've got the ancient woodland and on the other side, you have the ponds. So the ancient woodland is where our toads spend the vast majority of their lives feeding, burrowing down into muddy niches, and generally being as unobtrusive as possible. There are loads of unknowns about our toads' movement, but generally they'll be moving en masse from here to the hallowed breeding grounds here over a six-week period each year. By understanding the triggers of this mass movement, we can be there to help them cross when they need it most. We put up road signs warning people, motorists specifically, to slow toads crossing. We call out more volunteers when we anticipate a particularly warm, wet night, which will cajole greater toady numbers into action. We run community events and engage local schools to spread awareness and promote considerate motoring habits especially when they see us trudging up and down the road in our high-vis jackets and torches in hand. It's genuinely uplifting when someone slows or stops their car to ask what we're doing or to ask if it's or how it's going that shift. But bonus points, when they hand us a toad through their car window that they've picked up further up the road. Even when we head out and barely see a hop all night, it's not entirely fruitless. We're still spreading the word through just being there and we're truly making the world just that tiny bit better, which has got to be better than Netflix or phone scrolling any day. Thank you, Zara, for telling us more about the journeys our amphibians make. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna just take back the slide control. And for telling us about how toad patrollers in particular are helping them reach their breeding ponds safely. At least the toads know that if they reach their breeding ponds, other toads will be there. But for some animals, it's more difficult to find a mate. How do you find your tiny needle-sized mate in a hay meadow or in among the tangled vegetation of a summer verge? A country lane just after dark, down summer shabby, unremarked verges, a flying beetle scans the grasses for a sea green spark. There is one insect whose female has come up with an ingenious solution to help roving males locate her in the dark. Local conservationist John Tyler is going to tell us more about the glowworm. Over to you, John. Thank you, Emma. 
the the glowworm actually is our only member of the of the firefly family. Uh, it's a little beetle. It isn't noticed very often because it spends most of its life, at least two years of its childhood, actually feeding on snails. You can see this one tackling a, a snail that's probably about 50 times its own weight. And they have a, a rather unpleasant way, actually, of feeding. They, they inject a poison into their victim, which actually paralyzes it and allows the, the glowworm larva to feed on it. Uh, it. You can see this garden snail is actually producing all this froth to try and put the uh, glowworm off. But once the glowworm started, it was very hard to, uh, to stop it. And in fact, one of the first journeys that the larva will make will actually be on the, on the back of a snail while it's waiting for the poison to take effect. The, the poison is actually quite powerful. The, the larva injects it with these little sort of hypodermic type jaws that it has. And as I say, it, it paralyzes it, but doesn't kill it. So the, the meal is actually going on while the snail is still alive. It's all a bit unsavory. The larva will carry on feeding. It's, it's able to eat perhaps 70 snails in its lifetime. And it will take at least two years until it's large enough for the, the next stage in its life. It spends the winter under logs and things and then comes out the, the next spring to start feeding again. But when it's finally large enough to think about turning into an adult, then it makes a much longer journey. It, it actually has to switch from being nocturnal to wandering about during the day. And this is when occasionally we, we come across them. And it's searching for a suitable habitat for pupating because it will have spent its larval life hunting on uh, hunting snails in dense vegetation. Um, but it has to switch to a uh, to look for a more open habitat, which is what the adults need. The, the females need open space to be visible. The, the males need to have open space in which to fly. What happens next will depend really on whether the larva becomes a, a female chrysalis like the one on the on the left, or whether it will become a, a, a male like the one on the right. In fact, they often actually seek each other out even before they pupate. They'll pupate alongside each other which just saves time when they're looking for a partner. It's the sort of boy next door sort of uh, approach. If it's a, if it turns into a female, then really her sort of travelling days are over. She will shed the skin of the, the pupa, which you can see here she's just crawling out of, like coming out of the sleeping bag. And from then on, until she dies, she won't move by more than a, a foot she, as you can see, has got no wings. She's really just a, a large container of eggs. She's got no mouth parts, so she can't feed and no internal organs. So she's really just running on the fuel that she built up as a larva. And so what she does is she comes out at dusk and climbs up a, a grass stem or sometimes she'll operate from the ground and produce this really vivid light, which she uses to flag down passing males. It's an incredibly bright light. We can see it at, at quite a, a distance. And it's a, a chemical reaction that's incredibly efficient. You can actually hold a glowworm in your hand and it's absolutely cool to the touch. All of its energy is coming out as light and very little as heat and this will hopefully uh, attract a male. The male's much more of a, a conventional looking beetle really. He 
has proper wings and wing cases, so he's a very strong flyer. And he will fly over the grass, searching out uh, females glowing below him. The, um, if you see that the male from the underside, whereas the female actually has quite poor eyesight, the male has these, these huge eyes. And so although the, the female actually probably never even notices her own glow, the male can, can spot a female at a huge distance. His eyes cover most of his head. And he's so beautifully designed that he even has this sort of shield to protect his eyes. And then he has two little skylights, two little transparent windows, one above each eye, which allow him to spot a female. If he, if he drops and misses and ends up below her, he can look up through the skylights to spot her. So he's beautifully designed, really, for, for what he does. Anyway, if all goes according to plan, then the female very often won't have to glow for more than one night and sometimes no more than half an hour before at least one male turns up. The, the males can pile in. You can get eight or nine males competing for a single female. As soon as the first male arrives and starts to mate, then the female will begin to turn her light off and head back to the burrow where she spent her day. She'll start laying her eggs almost immediately, because I say she's sort of running on the amount of fuel that she's got in the tank. And she will lay oh, anything up to a couple of hundred eggs. These are about a millimeter across. And almost as she lays the last one, she dies. It's, she's just by that time so exhausted that she, she just can't carry on glowing. The eggs, like every stage of the glowworm's life cycle, actually glow. You have to stand in the broom cupboard for 20 minutes, letting your eyes get accustomed to the dark before you can see them. But they, they produce this light. And they'll take about a month before they hatch out. And then the little larvae, which are about the size of a tea leaf, then have to start making the the return journey back to the hunting grounds in the in the damper vegetation. The females' way of doing things of being sort of a, a pedestrian and, and allowing the males to come to her has worked really well for millions of years. It's allowed her, because she doesn't need to fly, to become much bigger than the male and therefore to carry many more eggs than she'd be able to otherwise. But unfortunately, this, this doesn't work <clears throat> in today's world. When glowworms first returned to this country at the end of the Ice Age, they found a, a very open landscape with lots of suitable habitat and were able to spread right the way up to the north of Scotland. But now, of course, as we saw with the toads, their landscape is much more fragmented and this valley, for example, this hillside, before this motorway was built, was just one large glowworm colony. Now it's two smaller ones. And if anything ever happened to remove the glowworms on one side, there's almost no chance that two larvae, a male and a female, could actually make their way back across that road and all that unsuitable habitat to recolonize the other side. And what makes it even worse is the fact that, of course, many of our streets and towns and villages are now brightly lit by street lights. This is the same motorway at night. And you can see the females in the foreground, not at all bothered by the lights. They have such poor eyesight that they probably don't even notice. But it makes it very difficult for the males. Even a, a, a really dim artificial light will increase the time that a female will have to spend glowing to attract a male. And the longer she glows, the more energy she uses up and the fewer eggs she can lay. And under bright lights, they can repel the males altogether so that the female will die without ever having mated 
and laid her eggs. And it's perhaps because of this combination of the sort of fragmentation of its habitat and also the, the lighting, the light pollution, that it seems that glowworm numbers are disappearing, not only in this country, but in most parts of Europe. That, and what's particularly worrying is that this is actually happening on nature reserves as well as the wider countryside. And so it really sort of brings home how important it is to really give them the, the dark conditions that they need in order to make that journey for the male to find the female. Glowworms. A country lane just after dark, down summer shabby unremarked verges, a flying beetle scans the grasses for a sea green spark. For heath nearby and pasture lands, the village stretches out its hands, a meadow turns to meadow close. A patchwork of new houses stands along the lane. The village grows. Cars and street lamps and windows throw patterns of artificial light on places where the glowworms glowed. I know a meadow still, where night is dark, with stars and glowworm light. Come out with me and look tonight. Come out with me and look tonight. Thank you, John, for telling us more about the glowworms. And thank you also to Barbara, our poet, for giving us a glowworm's eye view. The glowworms may spend their whole lives in the corner of one field, making what seem to us relatively short journeys. The toads may travel a few kilometres to reach their breeding ponds, while the hedgehogs may travel a few kilometres every night looking for food. But there are other species who make much longer international journeys every year. I'm going to hand you back to our comedian Alex Farrow, who's been chatting to David Baker to find out more. David is an ecologist and research fellow based at the University of Exeter. Hello, David. Hello, Alex. What, what have I got behind my head? What is it? Uh, you've got either a chiff chaff or a willow warbler. They I was going to try identical. and catch you out. I was going to try and get you to <laughs> guess which one it is. But how can the, we tell the, the song, difference? The song is the important part. The song is the important part. So the sound we just heard, that, that's the song of the chiff chaff. And that to me is the sound of, of spring coming. So they're one of the first migrants to arrive back. Uh, and... Uh, and I always annoy, annoy my children at that time of year because every time I hear one, I say, that bird, you hear that bird? That's come all the way from Africa. And so, so the chiff chaff is, is, is smaller than a blue tit. It's, it would fit in the palm of your hand. It weighs less than 10 grams, but it, can fly, but it flies uh, across the Sahara Desert, uh, across the Mediterranean Sea, um, all the way up through Europe, across the Channel, and it lands in a, a bush or a tree next to your house. So an incredible thing to think about. It's amazing. You were talking about the, the sound there. I mean, it's a beautiful sound, right? But you were telling me that maybe it's not as beautiful as I think it is. Well, well, my, most birdsong is about, is about staking your claim to a territory. So, so the shift <laughs> chaff, the, the, the male is flying back. Um, it tends to fly back you know, a bit faster than the female lands. Uh, lands in a bush and, and sits there singing vigorously to, to stake its claim um, to some territory. And, and that's the same for the, the beautiful robin song you hear in your garden, which you think is a, a, a lovely um, robin singing <laughs> away. It's actually the robin saying, keep out of my garden. So if we, if we could translate it, it would be almost like a, um, a football hooligan on tour. That beautiful sound is like, come on then, who are you? Come over if you hard enough. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the, the, the birds are singing like that to avoid getting into fights in a way. So it's, it's an evolutionary response to, to, to say, you know, let's resolve this, you know, with our, with our shouting rather than actually getting into a fight, which will, which will end up hurting people. You've got like they're very puff, similar puff to, chess sort of yeah, stuff. Very, very similar to football hooligans, like I would say. And so, uh, maybe this is a really basic question. Um, wh wh why do they why do they go to Africa? Why do why do they fly south? Presumably because they can't walk. Well, but but <laughs> why else? Uh, well, um, you know, so, 
uh, similar to, to probably you and myself, were, were they following the food? You know, so, oh, yeah. Um, All right. <laughs> um, that's definitely true of me. So, so you know, as, as the um, season moves on and you get into to autumn and winter, um, these, these um, birds that eat mainly or almost entirely um, insects, so aphids and, and small insects mm -hmm. like that in the, in the foliage, um, obviously they, they reduce number and disappear and so the birds then have to, to move um, tracking the food. So, but, you know, moving to um, sub-Saharan Africa where it's green and, and lush during, um, the, during our, our winter um, provides them enough food to stay nice and healthy. So think about it like this, they, it's actually more uh, efficient, energy efficient for them to fly all the way, thousands of miles wow. down there and, and eat and feed up and stay fit and healthy down there and then fly all the way back than it is to just um, stay put here in the winter. That's incredible. Um, there's a lot of international links. Is it true that Chief Chaff ha sort of, I can't remember the right word for this, is, has it got like a port? They sort of gather, they don't just all go at different bits, they, they gather in places. What's all that about? Well, I say, you know, a lot of migratory birds, they, they want to, um, to, to take the easiest route possible. Um, so <laughs> so they tend to, there, there tends to be points along the, um, along the way where they gather um, usually peninsulas sticking up into the ocean where they'll um, where they can just do a sh quick short hop across rather than having to fly along you know a long way mm -hmm. and so yeah you end up with 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 points um, where migrant birds get channeled through and um, and they're often points where where bird watchers will gather to observe them and um, people will gather to, to monitor them but these are really important sites because you know certainly for the chiff jaffs, but also for wading birds that require mud flats and areas to feed up, um, they need those areas to, to fuel up um, to do the next stage of their journey. And so if we lose those um, areas, those lush areas of vegetation or, or the mud flats, um, then it can interrupt the migratory journeys and you can end up with um, effects on, on the birds we see in, in um, arriving in the UK. There's fewer and fewer of them arriving. So. So a mud flat is a little bit like a petrol station, and oh, these are like exactly, trucker stops. Yes, yes, Got a little exactly bit of, that, little bit of exactly little current that. news in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they stop, they stop there for their McDonald's or whatever. Yes. Yeah. This very, you tell you said to me that um, the males arrive a bit earlier. Are the are the lady chiff chaffs spending long getting ready? What's all that about? Uh, the lady chiff chaffs are probably more sensible in that they they uh, they spend a little bit more time um, in the winter grounds. Um, the, the, you know, the, the males are trying to get back to stake a claim to the territory. Um, and so they have to leave a bit earlier um, and the females can arrive a bit later. But on the, on the other, other journey, so going down for the winter, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that the, the females and the older um, adults tend to travel further south. So they've obviously figured out where the, where the food is and, and they know where to go. And um, I think some of the younger ones tend to stay um, e even in Spain and places like that. So. E even in Spain? Yeah, even in Spain, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revealing some preferences there, David. Um, on the subject of where they stay, um, I'm told that the, uh, the chiff chaff is engaging in a very modern phenomenon of the, of the staycation. What's, um, what, why? Yeah, well, there, there is, there's been um, an increase in the number of, of uh, chiff chaffs particularly but other migratory um warblers like so black caps and things like that staying um in europe and and even in the uk over winter so i think we have about a, a, a thousand or so um chiff chaffs staying in the uk um throughout the winter and that's probably because the conditions are a bit milder so there's more is, is that a lot of chiff chaffs no not really um, <laughs> I, I don't know how many chiff chaffs there are well, I think the estimates are up to 500 million chiff chaffs in in the world uh, at the chaffs. moment. So, but they but their range goes from from um, from France and, and the UK all the way into through Russia. So it's a huge range. So, oh um, uh, and so there's a lot of them. But this pattern um, of birds staying around for the winter seems to be um, seems to be increasing as the winters become milder. Mm -hmm. There's more food for them to eat. If you were to recommend anything that somebody interested in the in the beautiful chiff chaff could be doing to to help them not stay at home and make that journey, what can people what can people do? 
we well, see it. See, unlike um, some of the other challenges that we've got, which you know, like the hedgehog, which can you can do really good things in your neighbourhood. Um, uh, these migratory birds really require international collaboration because they they span countries and, and political borders. And um, and so, you know, whilst we can manage the habitat really well in our local neighbourhood, that's really good. We also need to to think about um, about international collaboration to join them. To join up their habitat and and make sure these birds that we share with other countries um, uh, uh, stay around. So um, you know there's lots of good charities um, like the RSPB that are doing good work and BirdLife International and these these charities invest in in trying to preserve the habitat um, for these migrants across the whole of their migratory range. Well, David. Well, thank you so much. Um, I will hand it back to Emma. Cheers, David. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both of you for telling us more about the chiff chaff and the massive journeys this tiny bird makes. For the chiff chaffs, as David said, our landscape is just their summer home. Not all animals make such massive journeys each year, but most animals, even those who don't range far, do make one very special journey at the start of their lives. As young animals, they must leave their parents' nest or burrow and set off to find a home of their own. Dispersal. A young kite sets off. Here the wandering year begins. It will roam far and wide across the land, far from the nest where it was hatched, until the time comes to make a nest of its own. But now the wind whispers in the kite's russet feathers of a wide unknown world of freedom unfolding all the land laid out below for it to inspect. Tilting its forked tail, it leisurely considers its course. In the woods below, a tree creeper ventures from the crevice where it has been fed and fattened, crammed beside its siblings. Its parents will no longer wait on it nor is there food enough in this copse for nine adult mouths. Toes and tail cleave to familiar bark as it looks out past the drip line. In the distance is a dark smudge, the hint of far off trees, but in between emptiness, acres of bone white stubble. A space wide and shorn, laid bare and exposed to the sky. No place for a tree flitter. But threading through the plain is a green way. The tree creeper slips out into the hedgerow and follows it. Part way across the line is broken. A gateway of empty air. The other wood is near. It steals itself. Warily, quickly, it flits across the gap. At the foot of the hedge, a lizard tips her head to see at once the sky and her sun-bleached log. Her young bask beside her. Lizards cannot flit. This hedge fragment will be their world. The surrounding heath and fen is long gone, ploughed and drained, and these hedge dwellers are a relic, no new blood in or out. Away to the west as the kite flies are other pockets of lizards, in the cemetery, on the railway embankment, separating them Roads, ploughed fields, green deserts. Each is an island. No new blood in or out. In the cemetery, the cats have come for them. They pick them off one by one. No new blood in. If the hedge lizards fall prey to disease, 
no new blood in. Beneath the soaring kite, the tree creeper flits nervously, and one by one, the lizards wink out. We have followed the journeys of just a handful of animals, but we share our landscape with a myriad of other species. And just like us, they need to move around, to find food, to meet others, and to strike out on their own. Some of them travel thousands of miles, others can't and must have everything they need in easy reach. Many of them experience landscapes in a very different way to us. An open field or a road that we may stride across without a second thought, may be a fearful prospect or a life and death gamble for them. The changes we make to landscapes to grow and build the things we want in our lives and help us get around can prevent other animals from accessing the things they need. But it doesn't have to be this way. By taking a fresh look at our landscape and trying to see it through the eyes of other species, we can get clues as to where the problems are. Where our choices might have made physical barriers or be endangering traveling animals, where a natural highway may have been disconnected or where a patch of habitat may be sustaining someone on their daily commute or on a long distance journey or where our activities may simply may be making it harder for other species to navigate. And little choices, little changes on our part can make a big difference for these species. And after the interval, our storyteller is going to take you to a town where the residents have a decision to make and would value your help. Welcome back everyone, I hope you're all back back and ready. So we're going to move on to our interactive story now. I'm going to hand you over to our storyteller Gabriel Schenk. He's going to take you to a town where the residents have a decision to make and he'd like you to help decide what they should do about their dilemma. He's going to introduce you to some of the residents of the town uh, and the dilemma that they have and he would like you to help decide how the story should end. Over to you Gabriel. Exactly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. This short story is called The Waste Ground. The meeting had only just begun, but Vanessa was already bored. She had joined the town council six months ago, hoping to make big decisions that affected lives. But all they seemed to talk about were planning applications, potholes, and how frequently the dog bins should be emptied. She had half made up her mind to quit. Item 2174, announced Arthur. To consider planning application 1751-16E, single story porch, rear side extension to provide living accommodation. Vanessa fought just to keep her eyes open. It wasn't just the warm room and the comfy chair that put her to sleep, but the way that none of this really mattered. The application was approved on the condition that the walls should be painted white instead of yellow, and they moved on to the next item, which was about someone's right to remove a garden hedge. Vanessa zoned out, uninterested. Raoul was speaking. It's a messy, overgrown hedge, he said. I can understand why they want to get rid of it. My place in Cape Town has a metal fence, much more attractive. Raoul was always flying back and forth between his summer and winter home, only pausing when the travel bans forced him to. Vanessa couldn't understand it. She hated traveling even before COVID and couldn't imagine doing it now when it felt dangerous just to leave your house let alone get on a plane. At last, they got to an interesting item on the agenda. Item 2374, said Arthur. To discuss the waste ground opposite the community centre. The Meadow Close development comes with a pot of money to spend on community improvements, and I suggest we use it to finally do something with the area. Vanessa sat up. 
It wasn't the Paris Climate Agreement, but it was a start. At least the area in question was larger than a garden. Opposite the community centre? asked Raoul. That's a housing estate, isn't it? It's between the back of that housing estate and the old railway line, opposite the North Road community centre. Uh, the one with the pond next to it. Deb nodded. I know exactly where you mean. I sometimes walk there to get to the shop. We could do with some lighting. It's not safe there walking in the dark, especially when you're on your own. I'd also like lighting, Leonard said, and a proper surface. The muddy path isn't suitable for some of our residents. Who uses it apart from Deb? asked Raoul. No one, currently, said Arthur. I went there last week and it was empty. I've seen teenagers in there with their bikes, but I can't imagine they would cycle around it at this time of year when the grass is so high. Well, we should give them proper facilities, said Deb, like a skate park. Or a sports field, said Raoul. That's way it's for everyone, not just skaters. <laughs> Vanessa shook her head, frustrated. They finally had some money to spend and they wanted to waste it on another boring sports field. What about something bolder, more innovative? What about the bigger picture? We could plant trees on it, she said loudly. Create a new woodland there and make it into a nature reserve. The trees will absorb carbon dioxide and help us fight climate change, and they would be good for biodiversity. Some of the others nodded in approval, but Raoul shook his head. We already have a nature reserve on the other side of town. It's a good quality habitat. This patch is just an overgrown mess with nothing to recommend it, but it'd turn it into something for the community. Well, if we clear it up and plant some trees, it won't be a mess anymore, she said, trying to keep her voice level. It's better than making another sports field. Raoul was about to retort when Arthur cut him off. We're short on time, and this is only a preliminary discussion. Perhaps we could get some input from the members of the public who are watching the live stream. A vote on some of the options to gauge interest. Okay, let's see, continued Arthur. 9% voted for option 1. Uh, no one voted for option 2. 73% voted for option 3, turn the site into a woodland. And 18% uh, voted to leave the site as it is and spend the money elsewhere. Well, we will bear that in mind. Vanessa left the meeting frustrated. The poll voters had supported her woodland idea, but she knew that Raoul and some of the others would continue to argue for a sports field and probably win. It was still light when they filtered out of the hall, although the sunset was quickly turning the clouds orange and purple. She felt too fired up to go back to her flat and decided to visit the place they had just argued about to see it for herself before it got too dark. She surveyed it in the fading light. A long grassy rectangle, flanked on one side by thick bushes and the backs of people's gardens, and on the other by an old railway embankment. At the far end, the lights of North Road glimmered above a distant fence. It was bigger than she thought it would be, although it was hard to gauge the exact size as so much of it was overgrown especially at the edges where the grass and bushes grew tallest. Arthur had been right. It did seem to be a waste ground. By now the sun had dipped below the line of houses and the birds were preparing for nightfall. A green woodpecker took off from the grass and flew past her into the trees behind, making a sound like laughter as it went. A chiff-chaff tweeted in the bushes to her right, then fell quiet. She followed the path, thistles scraping against the jeans. When she reached the middle of the space, she spotted a dark circle on the ground over near the garden fences, where a fire had been lit. She waded towards it, curious to see how this place was being used. 
The area around the fire was flattened as if people came here regularly. It was a quiet, peaceful spot, far away from the bustle of town. She could understand why people had been drawn here. The grass rippled in the fading light, and she saw how there was more variety to it than she had noticed from the path. She could dimly make out white, frothy flowers in among the grass, and it looked as if something rabbits had grazed the grass short in places, revealing mounds that looked like ant hills. It was too dark to make out anything else. The sky had turned from orange to sapphire to black. A twig snapped behind her. She span around, heart thumping. Was someone there? No. She was alone. But something was rustling in the bushes. She crept closer, using the light on her phone to peer through the foliage, and glimpsed a hedgehog scurrying through a rotted hole in the fence, disappearing into someone's garden. <sighs> her relation at seeing a hedgehog up close did not last long, however. A dark shape caught her eye, moving through the shadows on the other side of the path near the old railway embankment. There really was another person nearby. She regretted using her phone as a light as it would have drawn attention to her. What to do now? Go back the way she came in, or exit the waste ground through the other side? If she went back, she would have to walk around the estate before she got back to the road that led to her flat. But if she went out the other exit, she would walk close to where this person was lurking. The figure was walking slowly. They kept stopping and bending down low and seemed to be peering into the grass. They turned and Vanessa glimpsed her face, reflecting the starlight. An old woman with white hair. Vanessa walked towards her, now feeling curious. The woman looked up, hearing her approach. Excuse me, can I ask what you're doing? We're just uh, looking for something. Our eyes scanned the dark, grassy slope. Can I help? asked Vanessa, although she thought the woman would be better off coming back in the day to look for whatever she'd lost. Depends. Can you keep a secret? She was intrigued, of course. I'm looking for glowworms, counting them. I don't like to advertise it in case others come and disturb them. Vanessa took a couple of steps closer. Glowworms, here. Can I see one? Yes, if you're patient and look carefully. She peered into the dark, but it could only see the faint outline of grass swaying in the breeze. Look more over there, the woman pointed. She kept looking until, I see it, a tiny green light. It's so bright, she beamed. A hedgehog and a glowworm, both in the same night. They're amazing. I had no idea they could be found in an area like this. And you count them? Yes. To check they're still doing okay. I got numbers going back years. <sighs> Vanessa thought about the council meeting and the changes being proposed for this place. I was thinking we could create a nature reserve here, she said, gesturing towards the open space. We could plant some more trees. The glowworms won't like that she said gruffly. They need the open grass to light up and find each other in. Trees are good for some, not for others. Balance is best, something for everyone. Hmm. Raul probably wants everywhere to have short manicured grass. He's on the council with me. He was arguing for a sports field. I know Raul, and he does have a very neat front lawn. But his back garden has nice patches of long grass. He does it for the bugs, to help feed the swifts. He had two pairs nesting in his roof this year. He's coming around tomorrow to help me put up my own swift box, see if we can expand the colony. Oh, really? That wasn't how she'd imagined Roel would spend his free time. Well, um, I don't want to keep you from your work. Nice to meet you. She left her to counting walking back to the path and following it out between the fences onto North Road. She stood under the streetlights and looked across at the community centre with its untidy pond. 
a bus rushed past, rattling loudly. She looked back the way she had come, at the waste ground with its distant huddle of trees at the far end, silhouetted under the stars. They would have to come up with a better name for it. It wasn't a waste of ground at all. Still, the council was set on changing it, one way or another. She wished she could ask all the animals what they would like, but she was getting the feeling they might have as many different opinions as the humans did. Was it even possible to find a solution that suited everyone? Something fluttered past. She looked up to see a bat snatch a moth round the street light and head off into the waste ground, following the scrubby hedge that topped the old railway embankment. A second bat zipped across the road from the community centre and followed it. What would you do? She asked them, but there was no answer. She turned and headed for home. What should we do with the waste ground? She asked herself. What should we do to suit everyone? Well, we're going to pause the story for a moment. And you're going to go into breakout rooms. You will be transported to this virtual room where you can discuss with everyone else in that room uh, what we should do with this uh, waste ground. Uh, there will be a facilitator there to help you and they will type up uh, your ideas and I will see them and I will incorporate them in the final part of the story, which we will hear after you come back from the breakout rooms. Well, I shall resume the story, but thank you so much. Uh, I wasn't in any of the breakout rooms, but I was watching the Google Doc and I was amazed by all the incredible thoughts everyone was having. So many brilliant suggestions. I've been typing them down, rewriting the story to try and fit them all in. I think I've got at least one good idea from each group. Um, so we'll see how we go. And uh, Vanessa will be the, uh, the mouthpiece for your brilliant ideas in this, the final conclusion. Uh, the final scene of this story. It is October. The waste ground has turned from green to brown. The chiff chaff has returned to sunnier climes. The last of the adult glowworms has died, but their larvae live on under rocks and deep within tussocks of grass. A woodpecker prods around the area where the grass has been nibbled and flattened, looking for ants. Vanessa passes through on her way to the next council meeting, leaving a trail of footprints in the sodden earth. She has been thinking about the animals in the waste ground and all around her, in the gardens, the trees and the sky, about the needs of animals and humans to move freely and safely about this patch of land and its place in the town. The meeting begins with more planning applications, but this time Vanessa does not zone out. She insists that someone should be only be able to replace their fence if the new one contains a gap big enough for hedgehogs to pass through. They reach the agenda items to discuss the waste ground. Vanessa stands up. We all remember what it was like during the lockdowns, she says, how it felt to have our movement restricted and how relieved we were when we could finally meet in person again or go on holiday or just go into town. Even now, some of us still do not feel safe enough to move around as freely as we used to. She glances around. Everyone is looking back at her. But we're not the only ones finding it difficult or frightening to get around. Let's make that space work for everyone, people and animals, so we are all free to move around safely. I had some ideas for what to do with this waste ground. We could make a new pond so that amphibians don't have to cross the road. We could have a, a mini pitch at the north road end where the grass is already short but leave the bushes for the chiff chaffs and the long grass for insects. We could spend some of the money on a bench for people to sit on and a proper surface for the path so the area is accessible for people and some lighting so that people can feel safe, but we can choose them carefully and turn them off when it's glowworm season. 
put up information boards to tell people about all the different animals that use this space. You could even add a woodland center, a place to help kids and teenagers connect with nature and improve mental health. A woodland walk for adults, bird and bat boxes, a hedgerow connecting to the railway embankment, creating a wildlife corridor. If we do these things, we can find a balance. We really use the land for the community, the whole community. She sits back down and waits for the arguments about her proposal. Raoul speaks first and she braces herself. What about your woodland plan? You said we should plant trees to save the world. I was wrong. There are animals living there who wouldn't be able to live there anymore if we planted trees. I talked to people and I looked at the map. That land behind the school would be a much better place for community woodland. If we spend some of the money on restoring the hedge along the old railway embankment, that will help animals travel to that area from the little wood on the waste ground and from the big wood on the nature reserve on the other side of town. There's silence. She looks at Raoul and she sees him nod. Eh, sounds good to me, says Deb. Arthur says, I propose Vanessa draws up a nature strategy for the town in consultation with local residents and experts. And next meeting, we can begin allocating funds. The others agree. Vanessa blinks in surprise. Maybe she will stay in the council. Sure, they can only make little decisions. That's okay. The little decisions add up to make the big picture. It is dark when she goes back outside. A blast of wind buffets Vanessa's face and hair, bringing cold air from the north. It feels exhilarating. A fox slips out of the car park and into the shadows of a garden. She watches it and takes note. As she turns for home, ideas buzzing in her head. She can't wait to get started. Thank you very much for listening and participating. Thank you, Gabriel. And thank you everyone for joining in with the story. We've now come to the final part of the evening where we leave Vanessa and her town behind and we come back to ourselves. My name is Dr. Emma Gardner and what you've experienced this evening is in many ways a creative version of the work I do every day. So I'm a research fellow based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and my job is to understand how other species use landscapes. So working with other researchers and conservationists, like those you've heard speaking tonight, I build computer models to help us estimate how the way we change landscapes might affect other species. The aim is to make better decisions around how we use land that better balance the needs of other species and people. Tonight, you've been doing just that, getting under the skin of other animals' experiences, understanding their movement challenges in our modern world, and thinking about how we can better take their needs into account. We're going to finish up with a Q&A session where you're welcome to ask our team of scientists, conservationists and writers any questions you might have. All questions are welcome from questions about the science and conservation of mobile species to questions about the creative process behind the poems, conversations and stories you've heard tonight. So you can ask your questions either by raising your virtual hand or by typing them into the chat. So the way you do those two things is if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little reactions button. If you click on that, you can find the raise hands button. And if you press that, we'll see you've got your virtual hand in the air and we'll invite you to unmute and ask your question. So just a little warning is that we are recording. So only use that option if you're happy to have your question and your voice recorded. Um, if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat. So in order to do that, you find the chat function at the bottom. If you can't find the chat button, click on the more button. That's two little dots. Um, and then you should see the chat button. So we've, we've got uh, one question straight away for our poet. The question is, where can we get copies of the poems, please? <laughs> Over to you, Barbara. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased that somebody wants to um, visit them again. 
Um, these poems have only just been created and they don't appear anywhere, but if anybody would like copies, I am very happy to um, email or post copies of them to people. Um, Emma will fill in the details, I expect, for that. Yeah, so if you just get back in touch with Cathy at the festival, and also we will probably be hosting them online so that you can read them there as well. Okay, right. There's a question from Mark and Claire, and this is to Zara. How do you help a toad cross the road? Practically, what do you do? Um, we've got our torches and we've actually got buckets as well, um, because some, um, some nights they can cross in pretty huge volumes. Um, so uh, we walk along the verge on one side, so the, the woodland side. Um, we start just at dusk and sweeping motion with your um, with your torch along the verge but also scanning across the road and um, their little silhouette is quite obvious and um, in your torch light when along the on the asphalt and then um, yeah you pop along and you pick them up with your gloved hand stick them in your bucket and um, the aim is to we do take data so we um, check to see whether they're males or females um, and then um, we take them across to the other side of the road um, as quickly as, as possible. Um, it's quite sweet because um, the, the way to tell the difference between the males and females, the females can be a lot broader in the head, it's the quite, quite big um, bellied, but the males, they sometimes make little squeaking noises when you pick them up um, because that's them saying, no, no, I'm a boy, get off me, don't get on my back. So, um, yeah, that's, that's how they... If they're being grabbed by another male, and that's how they would warn the other guy that no, actually, you want to go get yourself a female. Um, sorry, I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but yeah, so you get a bucket basically, high tech. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Zara. We have another question come in from Louisa. Uh, this is a question for Jack. So she's asking, I have a wooden fence on one side and a brick fence on the other side of her garden. How can I help the hedgehogs? It's harder to make a hole in an old brick fence. Yeah, that is pretty tricky. Um, in, the, in my village, we have a conservation society um, and we actually managed to raise a little bit of funds, funding and work with a stonemason um, to get through some of the, the, the more permanent um, barriers around gardens. So I would have, my advice would first to be, maybe to go on to um, Hedgehog Street website hedgehogstreet.org i think um and see if they have any information there and if not maybe you get in touch with your most local conservation society or wildlife group and they might be able to help you i'm not sure where you're based uh, maybe you, you could you could post that in the chat and i can see if there's anything have a think about it. if there's anybody i know around there but yeah it was it was a, a coordinated effort of the the conservation and wildlife society to you know some some of the gardens <clears throat> that we were working with had a difference in height of uh, 180, uh, 1.8 meters. And we actually had to build a, a ramp for a hedgehog uh, between one of these gardens and has a couple of staircases in the villages. Um, but yeah, sometimes it can be a bit tricky, um, so, but yeah, hope that helps. Uh, yeah, so the message is you don't, don't uh, resist getting imaginative, I expect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. and if you can't do the stone one you can always do the the uh, wooden one can't yeah, they exactly. yeah and that still helps great okay so we have a glowworm question now for john uh this is what types of snails do the larv larvae of glowworms eat right well they're incredibly non-fussy they it's almost impossible to find a type of snail that they won't eat there are a few that they they struggle with they like sort of nice round snails because they're easy to get into these sort of tall spire shaped ones are a bit tricky so they, they're not quite so popular uh, and there are one or two that can actually seal themselves <clears throat> into the shell so they but they'll tackle anything they, they any sort of snail or even a slug they, and they they're very clean they won't touch the the body of the slug or snail except with the mouth part. So they're really quite clean of the creatures. Uh, but yeah, almost any sort of snow. Great. Um, I have another question for Zara. 
<laughs> Sorry, this made me giggle when it came in because, because I remember what uh, a bucket full of male toads looks like. Uh, the question is, are there any gay toads? <laughs> um, I've not come across any consensual um, male uh, gay toads. Um, <laughs> as I said, you know, the, the, to be honest, when the males are, are raging with hormones, they'll just grab onto anything. Um, you sometimes see, um, I've picked up males who've just grabbed onto my hands and won't let go. Um, they'll grab onto um, dead females sometimes, or, and sometimes if you've it's vaguely toad shaped and uh, it happens to be a male, I'm going to grab hold. And they've got these really, really muscular um, forearms for holding on and not letting go. Um, so, but that, that um, meeping noise they make seems to be a pretty good release button. Um, but I've not, I've not come across a, um, a contented gay couple in, as of yet. <laughs> never say never. <laughs> so the male toads are a bit of a law unto themselves. <laughs> There's a question here for Gabriel. Um, so this is, was the village in your story inspired by a real village? Well, I mean, there's two answers to this. One is no, um, that we intentionally try to make this sort of applicable to anywhere so that it would be widely applicable to anyone in the audience. And hopefully it did feel like that. You know, there's a, uh, I mean, if you live in central London, you're probably not going to be facing these issues, but most of us around Oxfordshire uh, are going to have that kind of hybrid country town sort of issues. And we sort of made things, the details quite vague uh, to fit in with uh, any town. But the honest answer is yes. Uh, I live in Ensham, uh, which is exactly halfway between Oxford and Whitney. And I get very easily distracted um, by the internet. And sometimes that's useful for research, uh, like when I need to find out what a chiff chaff sounds like. Um, but most of the time it's very distracting. So what I do, because um, I'm a bit weird, I take my laptop out with me into the fields near my house. So I live just on the edge of uh, my village. And I go away from the Wi-Fi and I write in these fields, um, you know, usually in a corner, in a wooded area hidden away from everyone else. And sometimes I'm writing away um, into the, uh, as it's getting dark. <laughs> so a lot of this story was inspired by real life about it getting dark and being in a, in a kind of environment like that. Um, I write very close to an old railway embankment, uh, which used to, to run through Ansham. So that went into the story. Um, and uh, I haven't seen any glowworms yet, so that bit is completely fictional. But next July, I think, is the time I'm going to go glowworm. I don't want to say hunting; that's the wrong word. But I'm going to go glowworm searching. Uh, maybe I'll see some around Ensham. I don't know. And if you do, you must send your records to John. <laughs> yes. I, I have two. Yeah, uh, not glow disturb them. Oh, yes. <laughs> Don't put them in a jar and take them home or anything bad like that. Just leave them where they are. <laughs> Brilliant. So that leads nicely on to two more glowworm questions that we have for John. Glowworms are popular tonight. Uh, the first one is, where is a good place to see glowworms? Uh, and the second is, can a snail ever successfully defend itself against a glowworm? Well, taking the second one first, um, Apart from the, the example I mentioned a minute ago about there's a, a snail that actually carries a manhole cover in effect with it that it can seal itself into the shell. And I've never managed to find a, a glowworm eating one of those. But apart from that, no, there's, they're, they're very rarely successful. Once a glowworm puts its mind to it, it can normally polish off any snail. Um, the, the other question about where to look for them because of this thing about that they are so sedentary and find it difficult to colonise new sites, generally the, what you need is somewhere that has been there a long time. So, for example, a churchyard. If you've got a church in your village, the churchyard obviously generally goes back some centuries uh, and is just the right sort of habitat as well. You get some funny looks. It's probably worth telling the vicar that you're going to go wandering around in the middle of the night to look for glowworms. ones. But um, there's a good chance, anyway, to find them in a, in a churchyard or a railway embankment, if it's safe to. Um, even a disused one is, is a very good place to look for them. Uh, the If you want to go on, a, there's a number of people, including myself, who do glowworm walks in the season. 
if you if you google i think it's glowworms.org.uk um you obviously have to screen through all the glowworm boiler adverts and things but if you get below that then there's a site run by robin schedule and he lists um walks all around the country where you can go and see them so that you know what you're looking for and then hopefully you can have a look on your on your local patch but you you'd be surprised how close you are to a glow worm they're, they're really much more widespread than uh, people realize i think brilliant thank you and our last question is for david how is climate change affecting migratory birds so there's lots of different migratory birds. There's little tiny ones like the chiff chaff. Um, there's very big ones like um, geese and um, and many raptors. Um, so big birds of prey, um, and they're all you know being affected differently. And it sort of depends on where they're migrating, how far they're migrating, what they eat, what habitat they live in. Um, but yes, there are a lot of um, problems. Uh, caused by climate change, which is you know changing the the habitats they're occupying and and um, changing the availability of places to fuel up on their own journeys. Um, but at the same time, a lot are being affected by land use change, by the way we're changing the structure of land use. Um, so both in 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 sort of the European. Um, landscapes but also in um, a lot of the wintering sites in sort of um, in parts of Africa so you know we really need um, a wholesale um, attempt at um, conserving these species looking at both their migratory routes and where they spend their summers and winters um, there's lots of problems but um, lots of people trying to solve them as well so. great okay so I said that was the last question but two hedgehog questions just sneaked in under the fence so I'm going to ask them because I can't resist so these are for you Jack so the first one is what animals eat hedgehogs and the second one is to do with the poo but uh, let's deal with the eating first cool. um, <clears throat> animals that eat hedgehogs probably badgers it's probably the most popular predator or most common predator of hedgehogs although Humans don't eat hedgehogs, but they probably cause the majority of uh, hedgehog deaths through road accidents, unfortunately. Um, next question, the sparkling remnants of hedgehogs meal. Yes. Um, is it the uh, whole cases yeah, or does yeah. that mean it's another animal? No, no, it's, it's common to see whole um, wing casings as well in the poo. It's just a case of how thoroughly the insect was chewed before, um, before pooing. But yeah, no, you, if, if, if you're seeing a dropping that's kind of maybe three centimeters average in length um quite small and you see casings in it um it's likely a hedgehog hedgehog poo brilliant <laughs> lovely note to end on a hedgehog id note <laughs> brilliant okay so finally we have three questions for our audience to answer so i'm just going to share the screen again so we would love to know how you found this event whether you've enjoyed it and in particular, we'd like to know if there was anything that you learned that you didn't know before. How did hearing the stories and poems make you feel? And what will you do to help animals move around freely? And it's just left to me to say a huge thank you to our team of scientists, conservationists and writers for all the hard work that they've put in tonight. Um, thank you also to our Zoom room facilitators and to Cathy and the whole of the festival team for hosting us so brilliantly. Um, and thank you to the Association for the Study of Animal Behaviour for sponsoring our event tonight. Thank you, Emma. Um, it's been a fantastic event. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I really want to thank all of our speakers, poets, comedians, storytellers, and of course, Emma, for her input. So to Alex, Barbara, David, Emma, Gabriel, Jack, John, Zara, thank you all for your input tonight. It's been an amazing evening. I hope everyone has enjoyed it and we will see you at the next event. Thank you so much and good night.